look, we, we had these going rails set up. We, we had systems and, and, and laws and rules and regulations in place to make sure that this would never happen. And this industry and its lobbyists and its lawyers and allies on Capitol Hill tore down those guardrails and, and, and the spilling onto the street. And there was nothing that the DEA could do about it. There was nothing that the local law enforcement could do about it. There was nothing that the hospitals could do about it. People were just completely inundated by these pills. And so, you know, you, you, you look back on this and you say, like, you know, you know, could this have been prevented? You know, yes, it could have been prevented. And, you know, as, as Joe Ren and Nancy uh, would tell you, you know, these companies did not want to obey the law. So they just went ahead and changed them. And, you know, we have, we have, you know, uh, all these incredible scenes that you, you just can't believe that this stuff happened. But, you know, they, the, 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 the DEA has highly trained men and women uh, who uh, police this industry. And the industry knows this. So instead of having a, a revolving door that everybody knows about in Washington, there's now just like a one-way street. And they were just taking people, plucking them straight from the DEA, putting them onto their payroll, tripling, quadrupling their salaries, sometimes even more, going to the law firms that represent these companies. And one of the DEA's top lawyers was the, was the man who actually helped the drug industry write the law that undermined the DEA at the height of, of, of the opioid epidemic. It, it's just, it's, it's stunning. And that Congress would have approved this, that, that President Obama would have signed this into law. Like, either they weren't paying attention, a lot of them weren't. Members of Congress don't pay attention to a lot of the laws that they passed. And then there were a number of, of legislators who knew exactly what they were doing. Um, and some of them are still in Congress today, including Senator Marsha Blackburn. She was a congresswoman at the time in the state of Tennessee, uh, heavily hit uh, by the opioid epidemic. And she was one of the chief sponsors of the place. And she got a lot of money from the pharmaceutical industry. Speaking with again to Sari Horowitz and Scott Hyam about their new book, American Cartel Inside the Battle to Bring Down the Opioid Industry. This is KCBS in depth. I'm Keith Mancone. And so, first half of your book, which is the, I suppose we could say, almost uh, complete defeat at some point that the DEA faced in trying to rein in these companies, rein in this supply of pills. But then there's the second half of your book where we talk about the legal civil cases. The civil cases um, were put forward to get some recompense for these communities from these distributors, manufacturers, and pharmacies. And here there has been some more Tell us a little bit about what we've been seeing on that front. Yes, uh, more than 4,000 cities, towns, counties, and Indian nations brought lawsuits against more than two dozen drug companies. And there was a historic settlement a few months ago. The big three drug distributors, Amerisource Bergen, Cardinal Health, and McKesson, along with drug maker Johnson & Johnson, these 4,000 plaintiffs, cities and towns, Native American nations, $26 billion over the next 18 years for drug treatment, education, and preventative measures. So that's something that's going to be money coming into communities uh, for badly needed uh, drug treatment. The, the, the issue, though, is the families of opioid victims are demanding to know why no criminal charges have been filed against any company executive. Right now, there are about 40,000 Americans behind bars on marijuana charges, but not one executive of a Fortune 500 company that peddled opioids has been criminally charged. No company executive has apologized or accepted responsibility for their role in this academic, epidemic that's taken more than 600,000 lives, more than the military lost during World War II. And it's, it's not just history. You know, Scott and I thought uh, that, you know, the opioid epidemic right now is worse than ever. Even with the Sacklers on the sidelines really now, Damn, they're in bankruptcy. It's an Allen Cross in bankruptcy. That's the that's other company Scott talked about. But it's, it's uh, worse than ever. Worse than a year ago, worse than five years ago. The Centers for Disease Control says that for adults ages 18 to 45, 
fentanyl poisoning. Synthetic opioid fentanyl is the leading cause of death, surpassing COVID, suicide, car accidents. You know, we're in the midst right now of the deadliest drug epidemic in the United States history. So, getting back to your question, yes, there have been uh, there are 4,000 lawsuits brought together. There have been settlements, $26 million in settlements, and, and more. And if you add up all the settlements, close to 40 billion. But no executive uh, punished, no executive in jail, and the fentanyl crisis is completely out of control. All right, well, we only have a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to have to give the closing word to Scott Hyam. And I think where I'd like to close this, uh, if you could just reflect on where we're at as a A lot of what you're revealing is showing an ugly side of American politics, American lobbying, American business dealings. This is really not how we want our country to function. We like to think that when some kind of malfeasance occurs, the wrongdoers are brought to justice. But in this case, uh, as, as you suggest, it seems like the levers of power were really turned to an incredible So where are we at now? Are we in a better place in terms of dealing with this current unfolding opioid crisis that we're still in uh, and uh, holding people accountable? You know, Sam, Keith, the answer is no. And, uh, and, you know, and a lot of the men and women in the DEA who are, um, you know, central to our book will tell you that they, they have, you know, they, they look back on, uh, on the corporate behavior, not just in, in, in I think you know corporate uh, boardrooms. Uh, they they look at they look at uh, the bottom line. They see um, you know what 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 their what their exposure is going to be, and 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 whether or not there's going to be consequences for their actions. And there hasn't really been consequences. For, um, you know, yes, they they paid out a lot of money, but you know it's like the cost of doing business according to the DEA. Let's look at that one settlement that Sari mentioned. Uh, so the three largest drug distributors in America, McKesson, Marisource Bergen, and Cardinal Health, along with Johnson & Johnson, uh, you know, they, they agreed to get the $26. The day that that uh, settlement was announced, their share prices rose 3% on an average. And so they, they just kind of build this into their, into their bottom line and you know again that money the 30 to 40 billion dollars is going to help a lot of these communities it's going to go to drug rehab it's going to go helping you know addicted babies it's going to help these hospitals and paramedics but it, it, is the behavior of corporate america going to change and, and that and that's a huge question and, and we asked that to, to you know to joe ren and and he said you know because of for, for two two main reasons power and influence and as long as they have the power and influence and the money uh, uh, to, to throw around Capitol Hill and um, it, it very little is going to change. Yeah. Well, it is a harrowing story and a whole lot of harrowing revelations, uh, but we do thank you for uncovering it and bringing it to light and sharing it with us today. We have been speaking one last time with Washington Post investigative reporter Sarah about the new book. American cartel inside the battle to bring down the opioid industry. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me. And thank you all for listening. For KCBS and In Depth, I'm Keith Benconi. Stay safe, be well. See you next week. Good day, 58 at KCBS. First four traffic. Let's head over to the traffic center and get caught up with what's happening on the roadways and from you. Well, Susan, it's better news with the crash we've been following. On 880 northbound, just after Highway 237 Calaveras Boulevard, all lanes have reopened very quickly. We've seen the residual slowing clearing out here just a little bit near the scene of the crash, but it is getting better and better every time I check on it. Otherwise, our heaviest stretch of traffic anywhere in the Bay Area, that's the ride into San Francisco on the upper deck of the Bay Bridge. Uh, just after you leave the tunnel, you're going to find traffic jam.
stay up continuing into downtown uh, San Francisco until shortly after the Central Freeway extension and you make that connection with 101.